Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to continue uh, with uh, pathway analysis and talk about um, the en uh, enrichment map. So we learned uh, yesterday that, uh, that uh, we can use an enrichment test to basically find which pathways are enriched in a, in a list of genes. Uh, and this is an amazing, you know, it's a great idea. It's used to interpret data gene lists in thousands of papers. Um, if you go to the David, on the front page of the David website, you'll notice that they're touting the number of citations they've had. That's just one tool. There's thousands of people who use this, uh, so it's a great idea. And you get this list that is returned, like we saw yesterday, uh, with gene ontology terms or other, other path, uh, pathway terms and p-values. Um, one of the things that you've probably noticed in this list, and we saw it in the list yesterday, even the, the glioblastoma list, is that, and I, and I also mentioned it, that a lot of these terms are related to each other. So in this particular list, I have terms like B cell mediated immunity and myeloid cell differentiation, immune effector process. As a biologist, you probably recognize that those are somehow related, um, but if you weren't familiar with that, that area of biology, you might not realize that those terms are related to the immune system. So, um, so there's there's a major burden in relating these these similar gene sets or these uh, similar pathways. So, um, so what do we do when um, if we have a, a table of data and there's relationships between rows in the data? What's a good way of uh, dealing with that information? Anybody? How would we? What's a good way of visualizing data that's re, that has relationships in, in a table? A, a net, a network. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, so you learn. So that's exactly what we we do for enrichment maps. So we take that information and we um, we plot it as a, a network. And by doing this, um, it actually ends up being a lot more easy to see the functional themes that come out of the, of the uh, enrichment analysis. Instead of having a, a, a set of related terms spread out all over a big list, all the related terms are put together in a part, in a, in a um, region of the network. And the way that this, this um, and, and so as I, as I mentioned before with enrichment map, every uh, circle is a, is a gene set. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you more about how this enrichment map works later. But, the key point is that it makes it a lot easier to visualize, to sort of quickly see functional themes that come out of enrichment analysis. So in the following examples, I'll be using um, GSEA. So I mentioned briefly yesterday that GSEA takes as input a ranked list of genes. In this case, it's gene expression data ranked from the most overexpressed genes, the most underexpressed genes, and the ones in the middle are not changing. Um, and otherwise, it's similar to the enrichment tests, uh, or it's, this, it, it's a, just another type of enrichment test. But the output, we get genes sets that are, or pathways that are enriched in the up part of the gene list, um, clustered near the top, and also ones that are clustered near the bottom. So we get um, here, they're colored red and blue. So, um, so we take these, these gene lists, uh, and we uh, convert them to a network. Each node is a gene set, so cell cycle here, cell cycle here. Uh, edges or connections between gene sets represent overlap, and the thickness of the of the interaction, the thickness of the edge, is proportional to the the amount of genes that are overlapping. So if two pathways are related and they have genes, they they, they both there's the same genes, some of the same genes in both pathways. The more genes that they share, the thicker this line will be. Um, and actually, the the size of the node, which I forgot to show here, is um, if there's a bigger node, it has more genes in it. Um, and then finally, the color of the node is proportional to the enrichment score. So if you had David results, you could have a p-value or a corrected p-value mapped to the uh, color of the node. Um, and it, for David, because we only have one set of p-values, uh, it, it will just be colored one color. If you have GSEA, there's two sets of p-values or two sets of scores, one for up regulated pathways and one for down regulated pathways. So we have two colors. So there's three major uses of enrichment map. Um, we, it's not just 
uh, there's just the, the first one is sort of the simple case, similar to the enrichments that you did yesterday. Um, and I, um, in uh, these examples, we used a uh, published gene expression data set to, or we analyzed a published gene expression data set that was examining estrogen treatment of breast cancer cells. So this experiment um, had, uh, they took breast cancer cells, they treated them with estrogen, uh, measured gene expression data, they also measured gene expression data in untreated control. They had three uh, samples from 12 hours, and then they also measured the same, uh, did the same ex experiment at 24 hours, and they were interested to see the difference in, uh, you know, changes in gene expression between two, these two time points. Um, so uh, the gene expression data, uh, estrogen treated, was compared to control, and uh, p-values were calculated that met the correspond to the difference in the, the strength or the significance of differential expression um, at two time points. So we have two gene set, ex uh, two gene expression rank lists. Um, I'll focus on the 24-hour one, just one time point. And we, we ran this through GSEA and we uh, loaded the results into enrich the enrichment map software and um, which is a Cytoscape plugin that we'll play with during the lab. Uh, and you get this, you get something like this. You actually um, get, um, we, one, one thing to note is that we've manually annotated this list a little, this uh, map a little bit. What you get by default in Cytoscape is just the, the nodes and the edges and the colors. Um, and what we've done is we've looked at the nodes and Read, read the terms associated with each, each node, and then come up with a summary label, and then circled that manually. So these labels in these little circles, we've manually put, we've manually added to, the, to this picture for publication purposes. So if, it, if you're going to publish one of these, it's nice to kind of m annotate it a little bit more. Um, so in this case, uh, you, can, you can see that there's a lot of gene sets that are related to translation, RNA transport, um, and there's a lot of uh, gene sets, a lot of functional themes that are going up, and uh, a few that are going down. So here's the, the uh, blue is, the more blue the genes are, gene sets are, the more enriched they are in the down part of the gene expression list. And the more red they're, the more enriched they are in the up part. Okay, so, um, so this is, you know, much easier to read because you can just very quickly look at this and see the major functional themes. Yeah? Yeah. Um, they're they're very similar, but um, there are there they they are uh, different sizes. So here they're you know it's probably hard to see because they're just quite similar. Like here, there's um, they're very thin. In fact, this one's so thin it's hard it's hard to see on the screen. Um, and here's a much thicker one. So it's just a little bit hard to see, but they are different. Um, here's a sort of zoom in, so you can see the uh, actual names of the terms. So also in the previous map, we removed the names of all the terms. When you when you see this in the enrichment map plugin, you'll see all the the term names. So um, we've we've labeled all these terms. We've summarized them as microtubule and cytoskeleton, um, but they have names like microtubule organizing organizing center, centrosome. Um, and spindle and, and other things like that. So all of these terms are pathways are related to each other. Question? Yeah? Yeah, so so for publishing what, what we usually do with these maps is we um, we might choose the most important functional themes. Um, and just present those, and we might even delete other ones that aren't that we don't think are, are as important or not ones that we aren't focused on. So either present the whole map or just a focused subset, um, and then uh, and then for that we we do something like this where we annotate the um, the uh, we, we circle the, the functional themes and label them, uh, and then in the supplementary material I like to show a PDF like a vector based image of the whole map with all the labels so that you can zoom in and read all of the labels. And often we, it, it would be nice uh, if, we, if we're able to with the journal, we put a, a Cytoscape session file so people can download the Cytoscape session file and, and explore their, the map interactively. That's the ideal, I think. 
So, um, so the second um, sort of use of enrichment map is comparison of two enrichments. This is something that's quite difficult to do if you just have enrichment table or tables results. Enrichment results is listed in a table. Um, so if you if you wanted to uh, look at enrichment of terms at 12 hours and 24 hours and compare them, um, and you had two tables that result from David, you'd have to kind of manually match up all of the, the terms. So what we've done in enrichment map is we've visualized one time point as the color of the center of the node. So 12 hours is at the node center and 24 hours is, is uh, the node border. So we can, we can uh, quickly compare uh, the enrichments, like two enrichment maps, but on the same map. And um, so if we're comparing 12 and 24 hours, uh, any uh, circle that's all red means that the, this gene set, that particular gene set, is enriched in the upregulated genes in both time points. Um, and um, gene sets that are, uh, have uh, a white border or a white center means that, um, white means that the, that term was not found to be enriched at that time point. So um, white uh, center here means that these ubiquitin dependent protein degradation terms or pathways were not found at uh, to be enriched at 12 hours, but at 24 hours they were, they were enriched in sample versus control. And these, these little guys uh, are the reverse. So very quickly we can see that if we're interested in the differences between 12 and 24 hours, we can see, oh, all of these guys are up, but you know, they're, they're, they're important, but they're not changing between 12 and 24 hours. Only this little group here and this little group here are changing. So you can kind of zoom in on, um, on this, this, this group here. And uh, if you have gene expression data, that if you're working with gene expression data, so enrichment map is valid for any type of enrichment analysis. Um, but if you have gene expression data or, gene, or information that's like gene expression data, you can actually load that into the enrichment map and view heat maps. So you can click on one of these nodes, and you can see the genes that are associated with those nodes and the, the uh, um, a heat map that represents the level of expression across your different experiments. So these are the uh, three samples for treated at 12 hours, three samples for tr untreated at 12 hours, um, and then the same for 24 hours. Um, green means uh, up, and purple means down. So um, you can see here for this, this term, that there's um, actually the prote protein degradation is up in both 12, at 12 hours treated and untreated. So there's no difference between treatment and control at 12 hours. But at 24 hours, um, the proteasome is, is uh, in treated is, is, is uh, down. Um, so there's a big difference in um, treated and control. Um, so the, um, it, if you see a, a red uh, color here, it doesn't necessarily mean that the <coughs> Sorry, the, the gene expression data, uh, the, the gene expression is up. It just means that it's enriched in the ranked list when you compare treatment to control. So control could be up and treatment could be down or, or, or um, they could be equivalent like, like here, um, both up or both down. Um, here's, a, here's the reverse example, the replication fork. And you can really clearly see these patterns. A very big difference between treated and untreated at 12 hours and, and less, much less difference at 24 hours. So this ha really helps you zoom in on the important, interesting cat, uh, pathways that are changing in the, in the data set. Yeah? This is all in Cytoscape. So this, um, this uh, when, you, when you try the lab, you'll see that there's um, the um, expression data is not visualized as a little, but as a little, um, for, for publication, we, we put the heat map in this little box. But the heat, inside Escape, the heat map comes up just underneath the network. But this heat map is um, this heat map is uh, inside Escape, and we also added this for publication. So inside Escape, you'll have like column headings, and you'll have to know what those mean. So there's no nice coloring for that. Um, okay. So the third uh, use that uh, we we typically use enrichment map for is um, query set analysis. So uh, if you are, um, so in this case, and I'll just show you an example, um, basically what query set analysis allows you to do is take, uh, compute an enrichment map, visualize the enrichment map, and then add another set of genes on top of the enrichment map afterwards to see how that set of genes is related to pathways that are enriched. And there's different biological questions that you can answer with this. Um, in the, the, uh, the autism 
example that I showed you yesterday, we were using query set analysis to examine disease so known disease-associated genes and how they were related to pathways that we saw enriched in the copy number variant analysis. In this case, um, we took gene expression data from a mouse uh, where they, the, there was a knockout of a microRNA, MER1-2, in the heart. And they did gene expression data of heart tissue. They looked at, they measured gene expression data of heart tissue. And we compared to control. Um, and we did enrichment analysis and visualized it, it, it as an enrichment map. And we can see all the different biological processes that are changing when you knock out a, a microRNA. Um, and then what we did was uh, we took the, uh, known, the predicted targets of that microRNA, maybe uh, one or two hundred genes that are, that are predicted to be targeted, the target of that microRNA. And so for, for people um, who aren't as familiar with microRNAs, microRNAs are, are downregulate the expression of, of genes, of other genes. So they're mm -hmm. negative regulators. And so we expect that um, all the targets of a microRNA, when you um, which are normally, if the microRNA is expressed, they're normally downregulated. If you remove the microRNA from the system, they might go back up, or they might be um, not downregulated. So, um, so this triangle represents the set of genes that are known to be or predicted to be targets of, of this microRNA, and we uh, and the lines represent overlap, um, basically overlap of the uh, this gene set with one of these other gene sets. So we can, we can see, as expected, a lot of the targets of the microRNA, the predicted targets, seem to be uh, present in gene sets that were going up, um, which is exactly what you'd expect. And some gene sets that were going down, there's no connection, doesn't seem to be connection between this microRNA and, the, and those gene sets. Um, also, some of these gene sets don't have microRNAs connecting microRNA targets in them. Um, so maybe those are... Um, not sort of directly regulated by that microRNA. So the, the, you know, the interpretation of this map would be that the strongest connections between the microRNA, predicted microRNA targets in these pathways are probably the ones that are most likely to be directly regulated by that microRNA. So this is another, another use of enrichment map. We, we computed the enrichment map and then added another gene set afterwards to look at how it was related to the pathways. So uh, as I mentioned yesterday, um, we used all of these, uh, or a lot of these things together in this enrichment map that, that was used to study this uh, autism spectrum disorder copy number variant data set. And um, these uh, autism and intellectual disability little triangles here are query set analysis. These are the, the known genes. We were looking at how they overlapped with, with, with other uh, pathways. Um, and uh, in this case, we did a few extra things. So the, the red, the Circles that are colored white to red are um, gene sets that are enriched in the um, copy number variant data. Uh, and then these other yellow uh, shapes are pathways that are enriched in the intellectual disability genes and enriched in the autism genes. And then we computed overlaps between all the sets and showed them, showed them here. So um, this sort of puts a lot of different things together. And then, and then what we did is we, we annotated the the network by putting these circles around here and uh, labeling these using um, a drawing program, Adobe Illustrator. And I showed you this zoom in yesterday. Okay, so for the autism data set, um, we used uh, all the gene ontology gene sets and also pathways from KEG, NCI, and Reactome, and PFAM domains. So many of these gene sets are present in David, but I, um, I'm not sure for, if, if all of them are. Uh, we, we filtered um, gene sets so that we, we kept gene sets that were greater than five, had greater than five genes and less than 700 genes. And this, this um, led to 6,000 gene sets. And then the ones that we had actual data for was only about 3,500 data set, uh, gene sets. <coughs> So this, if you're interested in this, how this was done and other, other work that was done behind the scenes here, you can look it up in, the, in this paper that was published last year. Um, that actually reminds me of one question that I was uh, asked yesterday. Um, sometimes with certain types of uh, genomics data, there might be additional biases in the data set that, that, bi that lead to uh, results that, that uh, you need to correct for in enrichment analysis. So for this copy number variance project, um, some of the some of the co some copy number variants affect a specific gene region where 
genes from a sp particular pathway are all clustered in the gene region. So a common example of this is olfactory receptors. Um, olfactory receptors are all clustered together in the same part of the genome. Um, similarly, HLA gene, uh, genes related to the immune system are, are also clustered. And so sometimes if you, if you have copy number variants that are hitting those regions, you'll get a very strong enrichment in uh, olfactory receptors or something. But, but that will be um, mostly due to the fact that they're clustering together and not spread out over the whole, the whole genome. So, um, so some gene sets you might have to remove due to these biases in certain, in certain data. Um, there's, in general, most of the enrichment analysis methods don't, can, don't help you consider these, so you have to do extra work. Um, we did extra work that's described in the supplementary of this material of this paper, so if you're interested, you can, you can go look at that. I also noticed that just a couple of months ago, there was a paper that was published um, that tries to do enrichment analysis and consider additional information from that's useful for, or certain biases that are useful for cancer genomics. Um, it's called PathScan, and I'll put, I'll put that on the wiki. Put the, um, put that paper on the wiki, but they have an additional check that um, that they want to, that for, for a potential bias that could come from very long genes. If you're looking at, if you're looking at somatic mutations in genes, um, the, the longer the gene, the more, the more somatic mutations you expect by chance in that gene. And so if you're counting up somatic mutations and you're including that in your pathway analysis, you might want to consider that longer genes have, are expected to have more mutations than shorter genes. And that might be, uh, should, maybe that should be part of the enrichment analysis statistics. So there's a paper um, that, that, look, that uh, tries to develop a statistical method to consider that extra bias. Um, so, um, and that's actually an active area of research to sort of deal with these, these biases. But just be aware that sometimes gene sets might come up that um, are, are related to the sort of characteristic of the type of data that you're working with. So here's what the enrichment map looks like. Um, it is a Cytoscape plugin, so it's implemented as a Cytoscape plugin. Um, this panel allows you to load up da uh, data, so the David results that you saved yesterday could be loaded up here, and then the enrichment map is visualized here. And if you have gene expression data loaded, which is optional, um, you can visualize that as heat map here. Um, and this this panel allows you to. It has slider bars that allows you to. Uh, play with the thresholds of the uh, p-values, for instance. So if you were interested in just looking at the gene sets that were very strongly enriched, then you could slide the slider bar to the to one side, and this map would, will dynamically update. So you can just see the, the gene sets that are very enriched and, and see how the map changes using more stringent or more liberal thresholds. And you can make two-color enrichment maps and do query set analysis. Uh, these, these yellow genes, if you're working with GSEA, um, if you're familiar with GSEA, GSEA has a, a concept, an additional concept called leading edge genes. And it calculates genes, the leading edge are the genes that most contribute to the enrichment out of the entire gene set. And so those might be genes that are kind of very interesting to, in, in your data set. So we colored those yellow here if you loaded up GSEA data. Um, so, so that's... That's uh, the enrichment map, and we'll we'll get a chance to look at it in the lab. Um, the um, one of the, uh, the these just to mention some future work. How we're we're thinking of expanding enrichment map. Um, right now, enrichment map gives you a very nice global and enrichment analysis in general, and in the enrichment map give you a very nice global view of your data set. So you can see all the functional themes that are enriched, um, and it allows you to uh, quick uh, find quickly find things that you might be interested in, and you can delve in and go into more detail. Now, often when you want to go into more detail, you might want to go down to um, a, a level that's deeper than the gene set and see, for instance, how genes are connected to each other or map the, the results on a pathway like you saw that David has for keg pathways. So, um, for instance, on this enrichment map, there's a, a little section of uh, sort of apoptosis genes, apoptosis-related gene sets that we were interested in for one particular paper. Um, and uh, one of these gene sets came from React Reactome, which is a pathway database that has a lot more detail about gene sets, as I mentioned yesterday. Um, and so we were able to go back to the pathway database and visualize the pathway as a network. Um, and um, sorry. Um, and uh, so in this in this in this view, 
and this view, the circles represent gene sets. And so what I've done is I've taken one gene set which represents a pathway, the apoptosis pathway for reactome, and I've blown that up so that in, in this view I actually see genes. So here the circles represent genes, and the connections between the, the circles, the, the genes are, are interactions that are related to the pathway, like pathway and protein and protein interactions or reactions. And then I've overlaid the gene expression data, in this case it was actually protein expression data, um, on the pathway, and I noticed that um, it wasn't the entire pathway that seems to be in, uh, um, differentially expressed. One particular part of the pathway, actually there's two little parts of the pathway that were differentially expressed. And so zooming in on this a little bit further, you can see that there might be um, uh, interesting areas of this particular complex that are uh, changing. And so that, that allows you to kind of zoom into the gene level and eventually maybe uh, make some in, uh, hypotheses about the mechanism uh, that's um, you know, specific mechanisms that, biochemical mechanisms that are being altered in your experiment. So we'd like to have this kind of seamlessly uh, working in a future version of Enrichment Map. Um, another thing that we do with Enrichment Map is we draw circles manually and we, we, we label the circles manually. It'd be nice to have that in a, done in an automated way. It's difficult to do that because different people might want to uh, emphasize different parts of their enrichment map, and so they're actually making a conscious decision about what to emphasize. That's impossible for a computer to do unless you tell it what to emphasize. So, um, but but to, to, we're we're exploring different different uh, ways of doing this. And one um, a summer student uh, a couple of years ago built a um, a plugin or Cytoscape plugin. Actually, I guess it was last year. Built a Cytoscape plugin called a Word Cloud plugin. So if you circle, if you select a set of gene sets in Enrichment Map, you can pull up a, a the Word Cloud plugin, and it will show you the um, the it will it will show you all the 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 words that are associated with these gene sets. And the bigger the word, the more frequently it occurs. So this cluster is sort of signaling, and then there's different types of signaling pathways, and it has a little algorithm to cluster the the words into re related words, um, and so and there's a, there's a few different ways of doing this in, in Word Cloud. So Word Cloud is a free plugin that might help you um, quickly summarize uh, a, a set of nodes in Cytoscape in Enrichment Map. And then finally, um, Ruth Isserlin, who developed the uh, um, the Enrichment Map plugin, um, she was uh, really happy with the result, and so um, she. She decided to bake the Enrich Map cookie and bring it to lab meeting, and so we ate this cookie at lab meeting. It was really good. So the um, Enrich Maps are not only useful; they're also t really good tasting.
Okay. If I can get people's attention, I'm going to talk about the uh, or the last section of the pathway analysis part of the workshop, which is gene function prediction. And this also makes use of the knowledge about networks that we used uh, learned about yesterday. So, um, so I'll talk about just general concepts in gene function prediction, what, what it is. Uh, I mentioned it briefly yesterday, this idea of guilt by association. And then I'll talk about the Gene Mania software that um, uh, we've developed to help you do this. Uh, and it, this is also good software for sort of converting a gene list into a network. Okay, so the idea, um, uh, so as, as a general introduction, um, uh, a lot of data has been, is being generated by lots of different types of genomic methods from expression data and uh, chromatin IP, protein interaction, and generally this huge amount of data is quite fairly difficult to sort of combine and use all together. Um, but one of the main questions that people have often is what's the function of my gene? or what's the function of my gene list. And so, um, so uh, this gene function prediction sort of helps you collect all of that information and use it all to help you answer that question. And um, the uh, um, gene mania uh, software that I'll talk about is, is a little bit like uh, this, this Google sets thing. So how many people have um, played with Google sets or ever heard of Google sets? A few people. So it's, there's a part of one, one this is actually a very old part of Google that you can type in um, words, and Google will try to extend the words uh, based on uh, to find similar words based on the words that you give it. So if you give it a set of colors, Google will try and find additional colors, and we'll just do that by looking to see how words are co-occurring uh, in <coughs> web pages. Um, and so here um, we typed in three names: Memphis, Knoxville, and Nashville. Um, which you might recognize as cities in Tennessee. Um, and so if I click Google Sets, if I ask Google to find me similar words, Google finds Chattanooga, uh, Morristown, Jackson, and these are all other cities in Tennessee. So it's actually doing a pretty good job of extending this, this list to additional cities. Now, Memphis is also a town in, in a city in, in, in Egypt. And so if I type Memphis, Alexandria, and Cairo, which are other cities in, in Egypt, um, and I click Google Sets, Google now will predict uh, Luxor, you know, other, it will basically find additional cities in, in uh, Egypt. So basic, so Google has actually recognized that even though the Memphis was found in both lists, the fact that there's other, other words in other lists, it's sort of figured out the, the type of words that those are and extended those words. Now, this would be great for biology because you can type in a set of genes and it will give you other genes that are like that, those genes. So that's like a type of gene function prediction. So if I have, part, if I have genes that are part of the same pathway and I want to find new members of that pathway, I could type in the genes that I know and find new genes. Or if I have genes that I know are involved in breast cancer and I want to find new genes that are involved in breast cancer, I should be able to do that as well. Um, or, or any kind of query like that. Yeah. No. Oh. <laughs> so good thing we had our captured our screenshots before this uh, thing. Um, so um, so we're we're not actually going to use Google Sets for this lab. So it's not really that important. So the reason why is because we actually tried this with Google Sets um, that uh, you can type in a set of genes that are part of the same complex, and you ask Google Sets to predict additional genes, and it actually does a a, a terrible job. So, um, so um, there, we need to do something more for biology. There's not enough, uh, not enough power in Google Sets for biological data. So, so what we've done with um, is is created. Uh, so, myself and Quade Morris, who's a, another faculty member at the Donnelly Center, um, have created a, a system called Gene Mania, which does this. Uh, this answers this question for gene lists. So you can type in a set of genes that are related to each other, and then you'll, um, Gene Mania will, will predict additional genes that are part of that list. And it will also give you a network of connections of um, uh, how those, those genes are connected. Um, and Gene Mania is at genemania.org, so you can already try it out. So, um, um, so I'll just um, 
quickly show you a, a demo of Gene Mania, and then I'll, I'll talk about the concepts behind Gene Mania. Okay, so um, so here's a GeneMania.org website, and um, I can choose to find genes that are that are in different species. Um, so right now there's seven species that are that are seven major model organisms that are um, present in the system. So if I'm interested in a set of genes in human, I can type in um, I can just type in those genes there. And if I type in if I type in a gene that Gene Mania doesn't recognize, then it will tell me. It says there's an unrecognized gene symbol. Um, you have to fix that. So let me try another one. Um, and that one's recognized, and that one's recognized. So you can you can type in a few more here, and um, you can also paste a, a, a larger gene list, like what, your gene list. Um, I think the website supports up to a few hundred genes in a in a list. Um, and um, there's a another system that I'll mention that supports bigger lists if you have really big lists. Okay, so I've typed in my gene lists. I can also click click this um, button here to add in, to if you don't want to type in your own gene list to view an example. And then I can press go. And Gene Mania searches a lot of different genomics data, um, and it will find the uh, all the connections between the, the genes that I that I gave it. So I gave it um, five genes, um, and uh, you can see that the resulting network in Gene Mania is uh, um, contains a lot of different circles which represent genes and edges which represent different types of connections between the genes. Um, these connections are um, here, and if you want to have a legend of what the networks, what the, the edges mean, you can click on this button here, Networks Legend, and you can move this move this around to here or something, or maybe maybe down here. Um, and so co-expression is purple, co-localization is blue, genetic interactions is sort of light blue pathways, uh, physical interactions and predicted interactions are all, are all listed here. Um, the genes that I entered are the biggest genes that are gray, colored gray here, and Gene Mania has predicted additional genes that are similar to these genes. And um, if I click the Genes tab here, then I can uh, see what those genes are. And I can, um, here's my query genes, the five genes that I entered. And here are uh, additional genes that are, that are um, predicted to be similar to those genes. So RAD51 is the most similar to that set of genes that I, that I added. Um, and so it gets the biggest, it's the biggest circle. And then genes, genes are uh, listed down the list here, and they sort of have these numbers associated with them that are useful for ranking these genes based on their similarity. But these numbers aren't really useful for anything else. Like, you can't really use those numbers to compare between gene set, between gene mania queries, but they are, they are useful for ranking these gene lists. So genes at the top of this list that have the biggest score here and are also the biggest circles are the most similar to the genes that I, that I entered and ones at the bottom of the list are least, sim least similar in this list. I can also ask for more, for more genes to come back. The default is 20, but you can, you can ask for more genes. So the ni one nice thing about Gene Mania is that um, you can interact with this network. So I can, um, just like in Cytoscape, this is actually a web-based version of Cytoscape called Cytoscape Web, which is useful for people who are making websites, developers of websites. They can embed like a network in, in their website. So here is, um, you know, you can, select a set of genes and move them around. Um, and I can click on genes to find out more information about them. And I can go, go to Entree. Um, um, I, I can click on, uh, on connections between genes. And that will tell me where that data came from. So there's a, a link here between BRCA2 and XRCC2 that came from co-expression. These two studies, um, these two papers that published gene expression data um, have uh, these two, have these two genes that are co-expressed in them. Um, similarly, you can you can look at these other other edges. Here's a, a pathway edge that comes from a um, uh, a data set that's from from the reactome group and um, from NCI Nature. So you can click to get back to those. Uh, if you're interested in looking at multiple genes at the same time, you can drag these little tooltips around and and um, and, and 
have them all up at the, at the same time. So I'm going to close those. Uh, and then finally, there's um, a functions tab that uh, computes a, a gene ontology enrichment for, this, for the genes that are in this network. And if you're interested in seeing what those, um, you can just move your mouse over a particular term and it, it will highlight the corresponding genes. And if you want to save this color, you can click this little plus here. And I'm going to click that. And so now all the DNA repair genes are, are red. And, and now I have another color to work with. Um, and I can say cell cycle, I can choose cell cycle arrest and choose that one. And now I have another color to work with. And I can choose um, another one of these guys like nuclear matrix. Um, and now I have, I'm sort of coloring my network based on functions that I'm interested in. If one of these functions is more important than another, so you can only show one function on a node at the same time, one color on a node at the same time. So um, if, if I want one to take precedence, then I can just move it up in this list. I just drag it and move it up in this list. Um, there's a very, the, the, that's basically it for Gene Mania. It's a very simple website, um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of power in this website. I'll show you some, some advanced options here. Um, the, help, the help tab just is very simple. It just shows you a couple of pictures about how, how, the, how the interface works. Um, so, um, oh yeah, so if I, if I have uh, functions that I've selected here and, I, and I'm working with genes, I can choose the functions legend and this will this will um, this shows me the colors that I've picked for, for here. If I uh, get rid of one of these guys, um, it updates automatically here. So um, you can also save a report. So if I create a report, it will open up a report in another another page, and um, it takes a little while for the report to generate. But this report has. All the information about the network. This is a, a publication quality or vector graphic figure that you can you can once you've arranged it the way you like, you can save it in its high resolution. Um, and uh, here's the legends that that I showed you. And then here's the search parameters. Um, if I don't like the fact that if I don't really want to see this in the report, I can just remove it, um, and then it will disappear. If I want to put it back, then I can go back up here. I've removed it here, so I can select different things to add and, and add from the report. Um, and then when I'm finished, I can just pre press this big print button and it will save it as a, it will, you can either print it or you can save it as a PDF. Um, but here's, there's tons of information about all the networks that were selected, all, all the networks that were searched. Um, and, you know, it's actually really big, so you might not want to save everything, but maybe you only want to save the network and the list of genes. So you can, you can, uh, Customize the report. Yeah. So can you choose which networks to Yes. So the question is, can you choose which networks to search? So so that's under advanced options. Um, so uh, if you click advanced options, um, you can select among the different networks that are that are searched. So um, by default, uh, sort of a reasonable set of networks are searched, but you can click to enable all of the networks. Um, and you can you can go in here and you can say or I can look at uh, pathways. I can say I can look at uh, pathway pathways from human psych or reactome, and it, it tells you how many connections there are from that pathway database. Um, here are uh, co-expression data sets, um, and you can click here to get more information about the papers that co-expression was calculated from. And if I click on this, I will go to PubMed to to get access to that that uh, paper. Um, you can also upload your own networks. So if you're interested in, if you have your own gene expression data and you have correlation matrix, or if you have your own protein interaction data set or your own curated data set, you can upload your own, your own data there. And uh, there's a, sim a little help button here that tells you the format, which is very simple. You can just construct that format in a spreadsheet. And then you can you can upload it. So there are other tools like Gene Mania, like uh, String is another one which um, works uh, for more organisms than Gene Mania, and it searches slightly different networks. Um, the main one of the main differences is that Gene Mania is the only tool of the, of this kind that allows you to choose among the choose the networks that you want to search and upload your own networks. And the reason for this is that the algorithm for Gene Mania is developed by Quade Morris's lab is um, the fastest algorithm available and it's able to um, combine all the networks and search all the networks within a few seconds whereas other 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 uh, tools often have to be run offline to pre-compute everything because they, they take longer 
So um, the, uh, there's also um, different types of, of uh, options here. So here's the, uh, you can choose to get more or less, more or fewer genes. So if I, if I don't want any other genes to come up, any additional genes to come up, I can select zero, and this will give me back the, just the connections within my gene list without adding any new genes. So that might be useful if you're just interested in your gene list. Or you can get like a lot more genes, like 100, and um, you'll get a much bigger network with, um, with uh, um, more similar genes. Um, I'll, I'll explain these in a second. Um, Sim just relating to this uh, getting more, more genes, um, there's a new feature that we just added a couple of days ago, which, is, um, which allows you to select a set of genes that you might be interested in here, and then you can click this button to, to redo the search with just these, these genes. Um, and, or you can go to this query menu here, and you can say, do the same thing, rerun the query, adding the selected genes or removing the selected genes from the query genes or rerun the query with only the selected genes. So if I do that, then it will rerun the analysis um, searching the, the networks that I've chosen. Um, and, uh, and now it's only using the genes that I selected. Um, okay, so there's a few other options in these other menus that you can try, like you can change the layout or turn off labels. Um, there's this little box here that you can you can move around actually, um, and um, it allows you to zoom in and out um, or um, move the network around if you have a bigger network. Question. Yes. So for Cytoscape, in terms of dragging the network, um, I can just quickly show you. Um, let me see if I can quickly open up a. Um, So there's two ways of dragging the network in Cytoscape. One is if you have a three button mouse, the middle mouse button, um, clicking the middle mouse button will allow you to drag to drag the network around. Um, and um, the other way is using this bird's eye view, which you can you can move and, and move. So it's a slightly different way of doing it, but it, it does the same thing. Okay, so um, Advanced options. So um, by default, uh, Gene Mania Gene Mania has a couple of different ways of of uh, combining networks. And um, by default, it will do something that's very similar to Google Sets um, if you give it enough genes. So um, Google Sets, just like Google Sets, you have to give it a certain number of genes. You can't just say Memphis, otherwise it won't know if you're talking about Tennessee or Egypt. Um, so you have to give it a few examples for it to learn what you want, and then it will give you more things that, that you want. And it, so what the limit for gene mania is that it needs at least five genes that are similar to each other um, to learn what you want. And if you give it less than five genes, it will use um, gene ontology biological process to find similar genes. So it will, it will find similar genes that have similar biological processes to the ones that you, that you gave it. Um, so I'll go over that a little bit more uh, in the slides. Any, um, um, oh yeah, so one, one additional uh, piece of information is the ranking of these networks. So in this particular um, network that I, or query that I ran, um, the uh, most informative networks were predicted interactions and pathway interactions and then co-expression and then physical interactions. Co-localization was very limited and no other types of networks came up. Um, so um, this, these numbers here, this percentage, tells you how much information from this type of data gene mania is using to find similar genes. And the way that that works for larger queries that are at least five, five genes or more, um, is that Gene Mania looks for networks that have uh, a lot of connections between the genes that you gave it. So if you give a, a list of genes to Gene Mania, like 10 genes, and Gene Mania finds a network and those genes aren't connected at all in that network, that network will get a low weight and you won't ever see it. So Gene Mania tries to um, uh, weight the networks that have a lot of information about your genes and, and that the, those genes are highly connected in that network, it tries to weight that highly. Okay, any questions? Yeah? 
Um, I went to File, and then I create Report. I can also save um, save the information as various like different types of information as text files. Um, so, for instance, I can save the network as a t as a text file, and um, it saves it as Gmedia Network here. And then this network I can load up in um, Cytoscape if I want, um, and um, it's hard to sort of see it because it's wrapped here. But this has different columns: Gene A, Gene B, the weight of um, uh, connection between the gene, the type of expression, etc. So I'll show you later that you don't really need to ever load this into Cytoscape because we have a Cytoscape plugin that runs GeneMania queries inside Cytoscape. Um, and so if you're in Cytoscape, you can just get these pull these networks in directly from GeneMania. Any other questions? Yep. So I'll, I'll explain a, a little bit. So we try to update the database every few months. And I'll explain more um, in the coming slides where we get all the data from. Um, we, we pull data from other databases. So all the gene expression data and all the papers that are associated with the gene expression data, for instance, come from the GEO database, the Gene Expression Omnibus. And whenever that's updated, if there's a retracted paper, they have to deal with it. So we don't deal with any curation. We just pull data in from all the databases. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll explain uh, a few more uh, aspects of that um, in a little bit more detail. Just wanted to give you a demo of Gene Mania. So, um, so Gene Mania is, is, is using this uh, guilt by association principle that I explained yesterday. Um, you know, basically the idea is that if you have a set of genes that are connected to each other and all these genes are involved in the cell cycle, and here's a bunch of genes that are involved in protein degradation, and here's two genes that are unknown. This is unknown gene one and unknown gene two. You would, by looking at this network, um, and, and this is the co-expression network. So edges here represent co-expression in this microarray expression data where you have uh, genes, all the rows are genes, and all the columns are different conditions. And then if I, if I um, compute, if I look for genes that have similar patterns across all the conditions, and I draw a line that's related to how strongly this, how sim the similarity is, how strong the similarity is, um, that's my co-expression network. And usually these, these are calculated using Pearson correlation. Um, so here I've, I've labeled genes that I know are involved in the cell cycle, and this is an unknown uh, gene. Um, I would predict this unknown gene to be part of the cell cycle if it's co-expressed with other guys that are in the cell cycle, and this gene to be involved in pro protein degradation if it's co-expressed with other genes that are involved in protein degradation. So that's the guilt by association principle that I explained yesterday. Um, so there's two types of, of functional prediction that um, I kind of alluded to or I, I showed you. One is um, give me more genes like these. So I have some genes that are um, in the cell cycle here, and I want to find more genes like that. Well, if I, if I have this network, um, the first gene that I'll find is probably unknown one, right, uh, UNK1. So I would predict that this should be part of the cell cycle list. So if I have the cell cycle list and I want to extend it, I can sort of work my way out or, you know, explore outwards from the cell cycle genes in this network, finding genes that are highly connected to cell cycle genes. So that's, that's sort of the, the first way of doing it. So that's, that's the way, that's what would happen if you had a set of genes that you know what the, you know something about them and you wanted to um, extend the list or find more things. Um, uh, the other thing... The other way of doing it is, is focusing on an individual gene and ask, asking, what does my gene do? And so then um, you're, you're focusing on this, this unknown gene, and you want to know what it's connected to. And you would predict that it's involved in the cell cycle. So it's just two ways of looking at the same, same network. Um, so um, give me more genes like these. The Gene Mania system is basically doing this, just like the Gene Sets example, the Google Sets example that I mentioned. So it takes all of this information that we have and your query list, list, and it recommends additional genes that should be part of this query list. So in that sense, it's kind of like a gene recommender system. And there's lots of different biological questions that you can answer using a system like this. So um, I mentioned a few of them. Um, if you are doing, uh, if you're if you're gonna if you're planning a, an RNAi screen and you don't you want to do it you don't want to do a full genome screen you want, only want to uh, study 1,000 genes. Or if you're doing sequencing and you only want to sequence 1,000 genes, what 1,000 gene? If you want to if you want to um, 
figure out which 1,000 genes you should choose. Um, you might, uh, and you might be interested in a particular area, like a uh, particular type of cancer, and you know genes that are associated with that cancer. Put all the genes that are associated with that cancer in a gene recommender system and ask for the thousand genes that are most similar to the to those genes. And we'll, it, Gene Mania will will do that for you, for instance. And then you can take that gene, those one thousand genes, and say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna study these. Um, and then um, the uh, what the 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 second question, what does my gene do? Um, this in this case, you would enter just a single gene, um, like CDC48, and you'd use the Gene Mania type of recommender system to find additional genes that it connects with, and then you'd use enrichment analysis to see which which gene ontology terms or pathways are enriched in that in that network. Um, so, um, in this case, I type we typed in CDC48, and CDC48 interacts with all of these other guys, and I did enrich. The, I looked in the enrichment uh, functions tab and I found that proteolysis is enriched. So I would predict that my gene is involved in proteolysis if I didn't already know anything about it. Okay. Um, so, so gene mania handles those two questions. I guess it, it handles one other question, which is um, not really, really related to gene function prediction, but still very useful. Um, sort of a side effect of having gene mania uh, query all of these networks is that if you're interested in, if you just have a gene list and you want to uh, find out all the connect, all the protein interactions involved in that gene list, you can type that gene list into, you can paste that gene list into Gene Mania and ask it to search just protein interactions and you get all the connections between the genes in the list. And you can, um, and then you can use that in Cytoscape or you can do other types of analyses with it. Um, and you could even ask for all of the uh, genes, if you, if you type in all the genes in the genome into Gene Mania, it will find all the connections, all the, say, protein interactions between all the genes in the genome, and it will just give you that huge network, which you might be interested in, in, in analyzing. So Gene Mania has uh, three parts. It has a, a large automatically updated collection of interaction networks. Yep. So that's saying that you can use Gene Mania to create a network in your genome. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so, and and uh, and if uh, and so that that ends up actually being fairly useful, and I'll talk about that a little bit more with the Cytoscape plugin, Gene Mania. So uh, there's three parts of Gene Mania: this automatic database, automatically updated database of interaction networks. Um, there's the query algorithm that searches the interaction networks, and there's this interactive website that allows you to to browse the results. And there's a lot of link outs, so you can go, if you want to find out more information about genes um, you can, or, or networks, you can connect back to the original data. So this answers the, as a, a little bit more detailed answer to the question earlier about you know, how often things are updated. So here, Gene Mania pulls um, data from these different databases currently. Um, so we have uh, co-expression and co-localization data from GEO. Um, pathways from Pathway Commons, which collects pathways from pathways and physical interactions and genetic interactions actually come from uh, Pathway Commons and BioGrid. And Pathway Commons is a is a I mentioned yesterday collects data from a number of different databases: um, Mint, Reactome, NCI, uh, Human Protein Reference Database, and and others. Um, we get uh, shared domain networks from Ensemble. So shared domain networks are. Um, uh, a shared domain relationship between two proteins occurs if those two proteins share domains. So if you have a kinase, if you have a protein with a kinase domain, it will be connected to other proteins with kinase domains. Or if you have proteins with a similar set of domains, they'll also be connected with an even stronger connection. Predicted interactions come from a few other sources, um, like I2D. And, and then there's some other ones. So if, depending on the species, there might be some specific uh, networks that we've added. Like for mouse, we were, we were able to get a phenotype uh, correlation network for genes. So two genes that have that that when knocked out have similar phenotypes would be connected. So those are those are interesting functional relationships. And this this system is automatically run um, periodically, and we we update it every few months. And usually when we update it, we'll send an announcement to the announcement list, and we'll will uh, post something on the Gene Mania website saying that this is the, the latest um, data set is being updated. Um, the gene identifiers that Gene Mania recognizes are uh, gene symbols, official gene symbols, entree gene IDs, 
ensemble IDs, uniprot identifiers, and also some synonyms and organism-specific names if they're non-ambiguous. So I mentioned yesterday that you don't really want to type in P53 because it's not an official gene name. It's actually, you know, the official gene name is actually TP53. But Gene Mania actually will recognize P53 because um, we've, we've put in all the synonyms in there as well. And, um, and we've just removed synonyms that are ambiguous. Basically, synonyms where the same name has been attached to two genes, we've thrown, we've thrown those out, and we've kept the rest. So some, in certain cases, when there's not ambiguous names, it will actually recognize the common name for a gene. Um, so Gene Mania currently has seven organisms and about 1,200 interaction networks, most of which, half of which are co-expression. Um, and um, and, and we, I showed you the, the web network browser. So there's also a, a plugin for Cytoscape. Um, the Gene Mania website is meant for people to um, uh, sort of, if, you, if you're just generally interested in um, uh, doing a quick search, uh, but it's limited because of web browser technology is limited. Uh, so it won't be able to visualize very large networks the assist site will start getting slow. If you type in 200 or 300 genes, it probably will work, but we've, we've set some limit, which I can't remember. It's like three or 400 genes. So if you have lists that are bigger than a few hundred genes, then you should use the Cytoscape plugin. So the Cytoscape plugin is only limited by the power of your computer. Um, so um, uh, it, you, can, you can type in as many genes as you want in the Cytoscape plugin, and you can also select as many genes to, as you want to come back. So it's not limited to just 100. Um, you can type in as many genes as you want. You can, you can um, assign similarities to the entire genome if you're, if you're interested. And uh, the only issue with the Cytoscape plugin is that currently uh, the way it's implemented is, is that before you use the Cytoscape plugin, it has to download the entire database for the organism that you're interested in. The database is pretty large, and so it might take like 15, 20 minutes to download it um, on a fast connection. So, um, so that's a little bit annoying, but it's mostly, you know, once you've downloaded it that one time, then you don't have to download it again unless there's an update. Um, and so Gene Mania will, can, you can check for updates. Um, but this is a great way in Cytoscape to get networks um, from a gene list. So and this is what it looks like. You can just paste your genes in, in here, and you can select your networks to search here, and then you, you uh, away you go. And you get the results like this. That looks very similar to the Gene Mania website. It has functions and genes here, and the network is colored the same. So it's, it's mirroring the website, which is more powerful. And there's also, um, for people who are uh, power users, um, and you want to, if you're interested in running Gene Mania many times, for instance, and in automating it in some kind of pipeline, like say you're, you're doing um, a gene function prediction with uh, a new genome that you've sequenced or something, or you've, you just want to run it thousands of times, there's a command line. The Gene Mania plugin in, includes a bunch of command line tools that allow you to completely automate any Gene Mania analysis and save the results as text files that you can, you can, interact, you can interface with in another, in another tool. And that's very powerful. It has some, there's some very powerful um, tools in that plugin manager, uh, that, that um, command line, set, set of command line um, options for the plugin. Um, so we're, we're going to be adding uh, additional organisms like E. coli, um, also non-coding genes, microRNAs, and we'll be adding regulatory networks from chromatin IP and microRNA my mRNA networks. Uh, we'll, we'll be adding additional phenotypic information from OMIM, and eventually we'll be um, um, adding more orthologous information. So if you have a network in, in one species, you can map it over to another species. That's already done somewhat in the predicted section. So a lot of the predicted networks are predicted between species, um, but we're going to kind of do this in a more systematic way. Um, and so gmania is at gmania.org. If you want to try new features before they come out, um, it's not always, uh, there aren't always new features here, but you can always try the beta.gmania.org site. Um, and sometimes if the, if um, in a class situation, if you, um, lots of people are using gmania.org, this is another server that's independent that is off, often um, interesting. So, um, so uh, I included some extra slides that um, basically talk a little bit more about the uh, the other kind of network weightings here. So I'll just briefly mention them, but you can, you can, um, they're not 
it's, the extra slides are kind of going into more detail about the, how the algorithm works. Um, but uh, the only thing I guess I want to mention here is that there's a, um, if, you, if you really want to, uh, so there's a, there's, a sec there's a section of the advanced options um, called network weighting. And there's one, a couple of options that, that are under equal weighting. And you can say equal by network or equal by data type. What that allows you to do is um, bypass Gene Mania's um, weighting of the network. So normally Gene Mania will try and give you the most informative networks for your gene set, and it will remove other networks that are less informative. Um, but maybe you want to find every possible connection that you could possibly find between your genes. In, which, in that case, you should choose equal by network, and what Gene Mania will do is we'll just treat all networks equally and you'll get them all back. So that would be um, the setting to use if you wanted to just get, if you want to convert your gene list into a network. You just um, select equal by network and they'll all, all of the net possible networks will come back of the, of the type that you selected. Um, so there are other slides here that you can go through, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not really going to go through them in, in detail. It just talks more about the, the algorithm and how the weighting algorithm works. So um, any, any questions? So, uh, so Gene Mania, we didn't have a lot of time to go through um, an official lab, um, but we did include, and it was handed out today, an Open Helix tutorial. Um, I heard you guys learned about it, or heard about Open Helix tutorials a couple of days ago, um, but uh, basically it's um, a company that makes tutorials, and we've we asked them to make a tutorial for Gene Mania, and uh, there's a couple of pages there if you if you're interested in following kind of a protocol. Uh, for Gene Mania, you can follow through those those um, uh, pages, and it kind of goes through all of the things that I mentioned, but goes in more de it sort of shows you in more detail and um, um, a, f a, a few additional things. So um, so that's basically it for for this section. Um, any questions? So I guess to to summarize. Try to teach you some of the most common and practical pathway analysis methods um, and and tools that are that are out there. We've kind of focused on things that so so enrichment analysis is useful for summarizing gene sets, term, finding which pathways are enriched. Uh, that's the most common pathway and analysis method, and there's lots of tools out there for doing that, like David and and others. Um, I we've developed this enrichment map plugin to help visualize the results, and so. That's the way we prefer to do enrichment analysis these days, as we always visualize the results with enrichment maps because it's just easier to, to interpret that way. Um, and then um, I showed you Cytoscape, which is useful for network analysis. Really could only give you kind of a brief flavor of Cytoscape, so you learned how to um, use it briefly and, and saw how plugins work. But there's lots of other plugins that are available. Um, and so uh, and I, I tried to give you some pointers on certain slides that uh, can point you in different in different uh, directions if you're interested in, in in particular types of analyses, and you can learn more about them. And then finally, um, Gene Mania is a, a website that we've developed for um, you know a, a, a just I guess three things: one, gene function prediction, extending a gene list uh, or a gene recommender system, finding out what's uh, uh, what function a single gene might have, and then also converting a gene list into a network. Okay, so there's, yeah? So the question uh, about the clustering chart in David, um, so David, um, with the clustering chart, and, and you looked you looked at that in the uh, David tutorial yesterday. Um, the clustering results from David are are basically like a, a a way of making an enrichment map, but in text format. So they've they've tried to um, create little clusters of related gene sets, um, and you can choose different clustering parameters and group gene sets in based on those parameters. The enrichment map is a similar idea. It's grouping similar gene sets together, but it's providing a visualization instead of a list of, a list of uh, just a straight list of gene sets. So but basically those are conceptually similar, just two different ways of doing it. Yeah? Is there um, a 
me when they should write this book that a book for an art, for example, is there an API or something? Um, so there's a lot of uh, there is a there is an R package for Cytoscape that can allow you to control Cytoscape. It's called R Cytoscape. Um, it it allows you to do a fair number of things. Like for instance, if you have a network in R, you can visualize it in Cytoscape. But it's not as connected to R as it could be. So not everything in Cytoscape is available in R. Um, one of the uh, future goals of the next generation, the next version of Cytoscape, which we're working on, is to more closely link scripting languages with Cytoscape, so that you can control all aspects of Cytoscape from the scripting languages. So there is, there are, there is, there's actually a fair amount of support for scripting language support in R, but it's just not, it doesn't have complete coverage. So you might download a plugin like Enrichment Map, and then that is not able to be controlled by it from R. So if you were doing an enrichment, um, but you could mix, mix and match the, the tools. So if you used R for your, or Bioconductor for your gene enrichment analysis and saved the results, you could load it up into the enrichment map plugin and visualize it. Um, and um, that would be sort of a way of combining them, but not really controlling it from R, but just um, interconverting data. Um, so if you're, if you, if you, uh, so R, the bioconductor package in R has lots of tools, um, including enrichment analysis. So it can do enrichment analysis. And if you're doing that in R, it's just a personal preference. You can save the results and visualize it in, in enrichment map. En enrichment map supports by default GSEA, David, Bingo output. So that's specific output that, that you, it can just load up right away. There's also another option, generic which um, is any other tool that's out there that as long as it saves its results in some format, um, you, you, have, you might have to reformat a little, a little bit, but it will, then you can just load up a generic format. Any other questions? Okay. So okay.